E, herkese günaydın. E, hoş geldiniz. Ben e, Zeki Sarıbekir. E, DEİK Türkiye e, Japonya İş Konseyi e, Başkan Yardımcısıyım. Aynı zamanda Sarten Ambalaj e, Yönetim Kurulu Başkanıyım. E, bizim de bir e, Japon ortağımız var. Evet, e, I can speak English also, but today e, we prefer to e, talk Turkish. E, bugün Türkçe e, konuşmama e, devam edeceğim. E, we have in, e, translators and they will translate to, e, to English or Japan. E, Japonya İş Konseyimizin e, değerli üyelerinden Esin Avukatlık Ortaklığı'nın katkılarıyla gerçekleştirdiğimiz ve Japonya'da iş yapma üzerine ülkedeki fırsatların, iş yapma ortamının, ve çok değerli Japonya İş Konseyimizin üyelerinin Japonya ile iş yapma üzerine deneyimlerinin paylaşılacağı Doing Business in Japan, Understanding Legal Environment webinarımıza hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Ee, Japonya, Doğu Avrupa'daki en önemli ticaret ve yatırım ortağımızdır. Dış politikamızdaki yeniden Asya açılımı girişimi ile Türkiye'nin Asya coğrafyasındaki ülkelerle karşılıklı işbirliği ve fırsatları arttırmaya yönelik çalışmaları hız kazanmaktadır. Şüphesiz ki Japonya bu bölgede Türkiye için en önemli olan ülkelerin başında gelmektedir. Ve ilişkilerimiz günden güne derin bir ivme kazanmaktadır. Özellikle pandemi süreciyle birlikte tedarik zincirlerinin yeniden şekilleniyor olması... Ülkelerin daha fazla alternatifler bulma ve partnerlikler kurma yolunu tercih edeceği, pazarların çeşitlendirilmesi vurgusunun ön planı olacağı yakın gelecekte, Türk ve Japon iş insanlarının işbirliği yapabileceği konuların da artacağını düşünüyoruz. Japonya'nın dış ticaret hacminin yaklaşık 1,5 trilyon dolar, Türkiye'nin ise 370 milyar dolar olduğunu düşündüğümüz zaman, İkili ticari ilişkilerinin rakamlar olarak maalesef küçük kaldığını görmekteyiz. Bu nedenle DEİK Türkiye Japon İş Konseyi olarak karşılıklı ticari ve yatırım ilişkilerimizin geliştirilmesi için çalışmalarımızı yürütüyoruz. Japonya'dan ithalatımız Türkiye'de Japon proje ve yatırımlarına bağlı olarak uzun bir dönemdir 3, 4, 3 milyar dolar 4 milyar dolar arasında dalgalanmakta. Japonya Türkiye ticareti açısından da bakıldığında 2020 yılında e, Japonya'ya e, 441 milyon dolar biz ihracat yaparken 3.7 milyar dolar da ithalat yapmışız. Farkındaysanız arada çok büyük bir fark var. 3.7 milyar dolarlık ithalat yapıyoruz ama sadece 441 milyon dolarlık Japonya bir ihracat yapabiliyoruz. Japonya ile ekonomik ilişkilerimizin en önemli boyutunu Türkiye'deki Japon yatırımları da oluşturmaktadır. Türkiye'de şu anda tam 248 Japon şirketi 2.9 milyar dolar tutarında da bir yatırımı var. Japonya İş Konseyi olarak iki ülke arasında müzakereleri devam eden ekonomik ortaklık anlaşmasının en yakın zamanda tamamlanmasını önemlisiyoruz. Biliyorsunuz Japonya birçok ülkeyle seyitasını yaptı ama hala birkaç küçük konu yüzünden bunu e, tamamlayamıyoruz. Bunun için de biz de e, DEİK Japonya İş Konseyi olarak her türlü e, desteği yapmaya hazırız ve e, yapıyoruz zaten karşılıklı toplantılarda. Yine Japon dostlarımızla üçüncü ülkelerdeki iş birliklerini de genişletme arzusundayız. Biliyorsunuz Afrika hemen yanı başımızda birçok Japon şirketi Afrika'ya giderken Türk şirketleriyle beraber e, gidebilir. Özellikle e, oradaki altyapı çalışmalarında Türk e, yatırım firmaları, Türk inşaat firmalarıyla gidilebilir. Aynı şekilde hemen Türkiye'nin yanı başında olan Avrupa'ya, Türkiye'de e, üretim yaparak Avrupa pazarına e, daha çabuk e, gidilebilir. Ki önümüzdeki dönemde sürdürülebilirliğin, sürdürülebilir bir dünyanın çok daha önem kazanacağını da düşünürsek, e, Türkiye'de yapılan bir e, üretimin Avrupa'ya daha az e, karbon salınımı e, bırakarak e, ulaşabileceğini de düşündüğümüz zaman, Japon şirketlerini Türkiye'de, e, yatırım yapmaya, hiç olmazsa son üretimin elleşleme kısmını ya da montaj kısmını Türkiye'de yaparak e, daha sürdürülebilir bir dünya için e, hızlı bir şekilde Avrupa pazarına girebileceğini düşünüyoruz. Biliyoruz ki İngiltere ile de Avrupa ile de Japonya'nın e, İngiltere ile de imzaladılar. E, Avrupa ile de 
çok e, önemli e, STA anlaşması var ve bu Japon şirketleri için çok çok çok faydalı olacaktır e, Türkiye'den. Bugün Türkiye'den bir e, tır e, bir günde e, Doğu Avrupa'ya, iki günde Almanya'ya, üçüncü günde Fransa ve İngiltere'de olabiliyor. E, uçakla İstanbul'dan üç saatte Almanya'ya, e, dört saatte Perihan Hanım'ın olduğu İspanya'ya e, çok rahat gidebiliyoruz ya da e, İngiltere'ye. E, bunu da düşündüğümüz zaman Japon şirketlerinin Türkiye'de yatırım yapması için çok büyük olanaklar olduğuna inanıyoruz. Zaten birazdan e, hukuk firmamız da e, Türkiye'deki olanakları da e, Türkiye'deki yatırım e, fırsatlarını ve ne kadar kolay olduğunu da sizlere e, anlatacaktır. E, pandemi nedeniyle ertelenen ve karşı kanaat kuruluşumuz Keydan Renne düzenli, düzenleyeceğimiz 26. Japonya Türkiye Ortak Komite Toplantısı'nı da onlardan gelen bilgiyle en yakın zamanda düzenleyeceğiz. Ona da hepinizi e, davet ediyoruz. Ben konuşmamı kısa kesmek istiyorum. E, değerli katılımcılara sözü bırakmak istiyorum. E, hepinize dinlediğiniz için ve katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Dear Zeki Bey, thank you very much for joining us uh, and your opening speech. Dear distinguished guests, today we will try to provide you some insight about doing business in Japan. By way of introduction, my name is Ilay Yilmaz and I'm a partner at Essen Attorney Partnership, Baker McKenzie Istanbul, and the head of our Japan Turkish desk. We will now hear Mina Araito's welcome remarks. Mina is a senior counsel at our Tokyo office and she handles a variety of corporate and commercial transactions involving both inbound and outbound investment. Mina, please. Thank you, Ray. Well, welcome to Dake and Bacon McKenzie seminar, Doing Business in Japan. My name is Mina Rai Ito. I'm a senior counsel at uh, Dake and McKenzie um, Tokyo office. I'm also the founder of Zenmondo Ecosystem, an open innovation platform bridging Japanese companies with the partners in the Middle East and Africa. So 130 years ago, you Turkish people were a special and official guest to Japan, the Ottoman Navy's ship, Erutur. If I said it wrong, correct me, <laughs> but the, okay, the ship made it to Japan and paid a visit to, you know, Meiji Emperor. But on the way back home, the ship fell apart in stormy weather, but they're a true friendship was seen in Kushimoto village in Wakayama prefecture, where some Turkish sailors were rescued and transported back home. The friendship was given in return in 1985 during Iraq-Iran war when an emergency Turkish Airlines flight was deployed to rescue 215 Japanese passengers stranded in Tehran during an aviation brocade. So Japanese and Turkish have always been helping each other during these difficult times. And you are no longer a guest, but a partner to us on a personal level, as well as on a national level. Especially since the strategic partnership agreement signed upon Prime Minister Abe's visit to Turkey back in 2013. So last year and this year, we are being challenged by the universal issue, COVID-19. But here again, we Japanese and Turkish should work together to overcome whatever hurdles that are lying in front of us. I will first share with you what issues Japan is and has been facing lately and what is going through in Japanese people's mind to the extent that's relevant to your business. And then I will briefly touch upon some of the opportunities that you know, we should explore together. Once again, dated back in you know, 100 some years ago, Japan had decided to modernize its economy, its country by exerting efforts to education and science, 
by putting particular emphasis on technology and manufacturing. Japan made it successfully to the world second largest economy by GDP, now the third. There's a sentiment among Japanese people that is sometimes described as lost 20 years. After Japan's bubble economy burst in 1980, there was a period of denial where we were hoping and waiting for share prices and real estate prices would you know, jump back up to bubble time levels and you know, continue the bubble style rise, but that didn't happen. So there, Prime Minister Koizumi came in to reinforce reforms of Japan's government, legal and economic structure, together with abenomics and other factors such as globalization of the economy and the rise of the internet. These reforms and changes certainly created new opportunities, but we think there's more room for growth. And under Prime Minister Suga's leadership, there are more than a few reform packages that we hope could boost our economy. Among those, we have picked three areas of growth and would like to share with you today. One, mergers and acquisitions. Two, renewable energy investment. And three, digital transformation. For MNAs, Yutaka and Seiji and Duig will talk about the climate change in this area as to how Japanese manufacturers' portfolio management has changed and discuss, you know, frequently raised issues in this area and incentives for foreign investors. For renewable energy investment, now Naoki and Naiga will touch upon Japan's friendly package towards foreign investment, now how some of the regulatory procedures you might think that are complex can be made rather straightforward. And what the recently amended renewable energy law means to you. And finally, Kensaku and Irei will discuss digital transformation, trends and issues. Digital transformation covers vast areas from smart technologies like 5Gs and AI and modern workforce, including remote working and employment model change. And digital transformation also covers smart cities and future mobility. Now that a brand new digital agency will be established in Japan sometime in September this year, uh, there will be many opportunities and incentives that we need to be aware of. So please stay tuned for lots of updates in this area. And I know some of you are and have been doing business in Japan. I myself have been actually practicing law in many jurisdictions, including the US, Taiwan, Belgium, Egypt, and Japan. At Bacon McKenzie, I've been assisting Japanese clients who wish to go invest overseas. I've also assisted foreign clients who wish to come and invest in Japan. So most of you would probably agree, you know, Japanese people are not so bad to, I mean, okay to deal with, right? Relatively friendly and, you know, polite, trying to help foreigners. But is it easy to do business in Japan? The answer is probably yes and no, you know. Some of our foreign clients tell me it can be difficult. They think it, it can be bureaucratic, it is difficult to do any commerce across the boundaries of financial uh, conglomerate. There's a language and cultural barriers and so on and so forth. But some of these issues are difficult even for Japanese sometimes, but it's probably much more so for foreign clients. One thing though I've noticed is that cultural sort of a similarity and core values that we Japanese and Turkish people share in common. So I think at least Turkish people are, um, you know, have the, the advantage and, you know, um, should find it a bit easier culturally to deal, deal with Japanese business people. 
you may or may not agree on that. But as I said in the beginning, uh, we have the solid background to form a great partnership. And if and when you see any issues to sort out, well, let us help you out. Baker and McKenzie is here for you. And as you may know, uh, Baker and McKenzie have about 6,000 professionals in 77 offices in 46 countries. Baker and McKenzie Tokyo has been here since 1972, nearly 50 years, having 155 professionals covering vast areas, not only transactions and projects, but we assist you with your daily operations. In our Istanbul office, we have 93 professionals. So Tokyo and Istanbul office together will be happy to assist and navigate your business in Japan and um, you know, together with you um, to manage your daily operations. Well, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. That was really very informative. Um, now our first session starts with Perian Inje. She's a board member of Inje Holding a former chairman of the board, leading many other reputable positions in other companies and NGOs. Peyanum has a long and successful CV. I, I can't, I don't think I can find a time to um, express all of them here. So I will simply say um, she's holding many reputable positions in many companies and NGOs. Uh, she's a pioneer on um, various matters. Uh, today, she will share her experience in doing business with Japanese companies for us. Thank you. Herkese günaydın. Güzel bir gün olsun. Güzel bir e, toplantı olsun e, diliyorum. E, ben konuşmama Türkçe devam edeceğim. E, şimdi tesadüfen e, dayanım... E, pek çok görevimden bahsetti. Ama ben İnce Holding'den kısaca bahsedeceğim ki nasıl ve kimler iş yapıyoruz, bizdeki tecrübeler nedir biraz kafalarımızda canlandırabilelim. Biz 1952 yılına kuruluşu dayanan bir firmayız. Otomatikte faaliyet gösteriyoruz. Şu anda 10 şirketimiz var. Bunların 9'u fabrika ve üretim tesisi. 3000 çalışanımız var. Tim ve ISO sıralamasında, 500 sıralamasında çok uzun sürelerdir. 3 firmamızda bulunuyoruz. Üretimimizin %60'ından fazlasını yüzden ülke, yüzden fazla ülkeye ihracat yapıyoruz. Ee, ve dediğim gibi yüzde seksen dokuzluk cirozun yüzde seksen dokuz faaliyetlerimizden geliyor. Son on yılda ortalama büyüme oranı yüzde yirmi üç. Lütfen bunu bir yere not edin. Ee, çünkü burada ortaklıkların çok büyük önemi var. Ee, 2020'de de e, TL bazında büyüme oranımız yüzde sekiz. Ee, şimdi biz nasıl e, bu büyümeyi e, sağlıyoruz? E, biraz önce bahsettiğimiz 98'deki krizler, global krizler. Biz 2001'de e, Türkiye'deki krizi çok ağır yaşadık. Yani çok borçlu yakalandık. E, döviz borcumuz olmasa da e, çok ciddi sarsık. Ondan sonra yeniden yapılandırdık ve o sırada olan e, o sıra e, Amerikalılarla ortak olduğumuz iki firmamız vardı. E, biz bunları yeniden yapılandırdık. E, onlar da o sırada globalde e, şeye girdiler, e, chapter eleven'a girdiler. Neyse karşılıklı ortaklarla biz bir şekilde krizlerden çıktık. Ondan sonra da baktık ki biz yabancılarla çok güzel ortaklıklar kurabiliyoruz, çok başarılı. Bu bizim güçlü kasamız. Ondan sonraki stratejimiz de yabancı ortaklıklarla büyümek oldu. Zaman zaman size söyleyeyim, yüzde kaç oranındasınız? Yüzdesi önemli değil. Azınlık ya da çoğunluk olmak hiç önemli değil. Önemli olan, Karşınızdaki ortağınızla birlikte yatırım yapıyor 
ve büyüyor olduk. Ee, buna özellikle vurguluyorum. Çünkü benim aslında Türkiye ile Japonya arasındaki ilişkilerde de böyle bir düşünce, böyle bir mindsetle e, gidersek e, çok daha fazlasını birlikte elde ed- ed- ed- edebileceğimize inanıyorum. E, Mina Hanım Zeki Bey bahsetti. Biz e, Japonlarla Afrika'da ya da diğer e, ülkelerde e, birlikte yatırımlar yaparak büyüyebiliriz. E, Japonya ya da Doğu'da yapacağımız yatırımlarla oradaki o bölgede çok daha verimli e, çalışmalar, sonuçlar e, elde edebiliriz. E, bizim ortaklıklarımıza, e, deneyimize bakarsak, e, Fransız, Avusturyalı, Birleşik Devletler'den Brezilyalı ve Japon ortaklarımız oldu. Çok. Şu anda ben İspanya'dayım e, ve İspanya'da işlerim için bulunuyorum. E, kültürler arası çalışmak e, çok e, farklı esnek olmayı gerektiriyor ve biz Türkler bu esnek çalışma e, ve adapte olma e, kasız çok güçlü. Bunu çok Rahat yapıyorum. Eminim e, günün ilerleyen konuşmalarında da e, bu vurgulanacaktır. E, dolayısıyla e, şimdi dün şöyle bir tecrübemi aktarayım ben size. E, sabahleyin Japon ortaklarımızda e, ortaklık toplantımız, shareholder meeting vardı. E, ve ben onun arkasından çıktım. İspanyol, İspanyollarla görüştüm. Orada zamanla karşı yarışırken ee, İspanya'da avukatımla olan e, toplantıya avukatım bildirmeden geldi. Şimdi böyle iki zıt e, olabilen şeylerde bir e, kendinize alan yaratıyorsunuz. Yani ben İspanya'ya geldiğimde her şey yolunda gitmeyebilir ve ben buna hazır olmalıyım e, şeklinde bir mindsetle geliyorum. Ama Japon ortaklarına bir şey oturduğumda her şeye kontrol altında mı? Her şeyi zamanında mı yapıyorum? Kaliten, işimin kalitesi e, nasıl? Bunların hepsini e, kontrol etmek durumundayım. E, bu Brezilyalılarla farklı, Amerikalılarla farklı. Hepsiyle e, bir dengelenmeye çalışıyoruz. Ama Japonlarla ve Japon ortaklarımızla çalışırken ee, bazı e, geriye de dönüp baktığında şu anda e, Inci Holding'in e, iki e, önemli e, ortaklığı var. Birisi Inci GS USA, GS USA Japon GS USA ile ortaklığımız 2015'te gerçekleştirdik ve hızla büyüyerek e, devam ediyor. O zamanlar 3-4 milyon olan <gülüyor> akü üretim kapasitemiz. 7 milyona doğru gidiyor. Çok hızlı ve sürekli pandemiye rağmen yatırımlarımıza devam ettik. Diğeri 2012 yılında başlattığımız Yusen Lojistik'le olan ortaklığımız 2014'te ki onların lojistik Yusen ile İnci Lojistik merge oldu. O da çok başarılı bir şekilde gene büyüyerek devam ediyor. Diğer yandan Brezilyalılarla Maxion e, jant e, üretiminde 12 milyon e, jant üretiyoruz. Biz e, tabi Maxion e, önce Brezilyalı değildi. Önce Almandı, sonra Amerikalı oldu, sonra Brezilyalı oldu. Bu üç karşımızda firma hep aynı isimler değişti, satın almalar oldu. Biz aynı olarak kaldık 92 senesinden beri. <gülüyor> Karşımızdaki kültürler değişmesine rağmen biz hepsiyle e, iyi ilişkiler e, sürdürmeyi e, başardık. E, şimdi e, akü üretimi, jant üretimi var, lojistiğimiz var. Bunun yanında hizmetle ilgili e, yaptığımız minibar e, üretimimiz de var. Ee, şimdi Japonlarla e, nasıl çalıştık, nasıl e, bu kadar iki ortağımız oldu? Yani üçüncüsü e, gelse kesinlikle itirazımız olmaz. E, şimdi bütün kültürlerde bazı şeyler aynı ama bizim en önem verdiğimiz şey biz bir aile şirketiyiz, tamamen ince ailesine ait e, bütün e, şeylerimiz, e, ortaklarımız e, aile üyesi. Dolayısıyla e, güven ilişkisi e, bizim için ve bütün iş ilişkileri için önemli ama biz karşımızdakine güvenmeliyiz. 
saygı önemli, geleneklerimize e, saygı gösterilmesi önemli. E, misafirperver bir yapımız var. Hizmet kültürümüz de e, fazla. Yani dostluk ilişkilerini iyi kurmayı önemsiyoruz. Kurumsallık ilkelerine çok önem veriyorum. İyi bir ortaklığın vazgeçilmezi bizce bu. Şöyle bir kuralımız var. Bizden daha az kurumsal olan e, herhangi bir e, firmayla ortaklık yapmıyoruz. Baştan bu bir checklistimizin ilk maddesi. E, tabii ailenizin ve şirketlerimizin reputasyonu itibarı çok önemli. Bir de risk yönetimine özel önem veriyoruz. Ama iki kültür biz şunu fark ettik e, bu kadar zamanki ortaklığımızda. Ee, Japon kültürü çok mütevazi bir kültür ee, ve iki kültür birbirini çok iyi tamamlıyor. Şöyle ki Japon e, kültüründe iş yapma şeklinde daha planlılar. Zamana değer veriyorlar. Her stand, yani her işin standartlaşması önemli. Stratejik düşünüp planlama e, önemli. Kültür ve insan odaklı. Yani her şey kar vesaireden önce insan geliyor. Bu çok çok önemli e, ve önümüzdeki zamanda da zaten son yaşadıklarımız bunu ön plana da çıkardı. Bunu anlamayan varsa da her şey önce insan, insandan sonra diğer e, maddi şeylere bakıyoruz. Saygınlık itibar onlar için önemli. Çok gelişmiş üretim sistemleri var. Biraz önce bahsedildi teknoloji ve üretimle ilgili e, şeylerde çok e, iyiler. E, takım başarısına önem veriyorlar. Mükemmel ve biraz önce dedim kaliteli iş sonuçları onlar için önemli. Hesaplı ve planlama iş yap e, önemli. E, bir Japon e, yöneticimiz şöyle demişti. Türkler e, göç yolda düzülür. Japonlar e, göç önce düzülür ondan sonra yola, yola çıkar. E, şeklinde. Yani önceden planlamak ve bütün riskleri önceden hesap etmek çok güzel. İşte bu Türklerin eksik olan tarafını tamamlıyor. E, Türkler ne yapıyor? E, adaptasyon kabiliyetimiz yüksek, çevik, dinamik, daha fleksibel. E, kriz yani o kadar çok kriz yaşadık. Şimdi Japonya'nın şeyine biz ortaklarımızda en e, zorlandığımız şey şu. Yani krizde böyle bir krizde nasıl yönetiyoruz? Biz bu kadar değişken, volatil olan bir ortama nasıl uyum sağlıyoruz? Yani buradaki verdiğimiz güven çok çok önemli. Çünkü burada bir şeyimiz var. Ve değer odaklıyız. Ahlaki değerlerin, etik değerlerin yüksek olması çok önemli. Gene biz de üretim ve maliyet odaklıyız, çözüm odaklıyız Türk şeysi olarak o olmadı bu bu olmadı bu mutlaka oldurmaya doğru bırakıvermek pes etmek e, pek bize e, göre değil ve 7-24 çalışabiliyoruz e, Japonlarda da bu var yani çalışkanlık e, çok e, her iki ülkenin de e, şey oldu çünkü bir, birisi bir taraf biraz daha ağır olduğunda o iyice de iş e, zorlaşabiliyor e, yani e, benim en başta söylemek istediğim şey biz Japon firmalarda dünyanın neresinde olursa olsun çok güzel işler yapabiliriz ve ortaklıklarla ilgileniriz. Son olarak vurgulamak istediğim Zeki Bey biraz bahsetti ama ben bir adım daha ileriye götüreceğim. Dış ticaret dengesine baktığımızda 2020 rakamları, Zeki Bey'in rakamları öyle. Yani e, 3 milyar 742 e, milyon gibi e, Türkiye'ye bir e, şey var, e, ihracat var. Japonya'nın Türkiye'nin 441 milyon var. Ama gelelim 2021'e. 91 milyon, 91,5 milyon Türkiye'den oradan da 653 milyon. Geldiğimiz yer düşüş korkunç. Şimdi burada kazanan yok. Yani evet ithalat ihracat dengesi e, aşırı bir açıklık var. Bunu kapatmak için biz Türk iş adamlarının mutlaka 
e, Doğu'da, Japonya'da yatırımlarda bulunması önemli. Ama bu farkı biz yurt dışında birlikte iş yaparak farklı şekilde kompanse etmemiz gerektiğine ben inanıyorum. Bunun da en önemli parçası serbest ticaret anlaşması. Uzun senelerdir. Ben iki sene önce e, Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımızla birlikte Japonya'ya gittim. Bu imzalanacak diye. İmzalandı. Hala imzalandı. E, ben bu konuda özel çalışma yapılması bizim e, Deyip Japonya Konseyi olarak da e, devlet makamları düzeyinde de bunun hızla yapılması. Şimdi AB ile yapılan ticaret anlaşmasıları da bunu destekleyebileceği gibi rekabetli Türkiye'nin önüne geçebilirler. Bunu bizim e, Türk iş dünyası, e, Japon iş dünyası olarak fark etmemiz ve bir an önce önlemlerini almamız e, gerekiyor. Yoksa bizim tica- şey, dış ticaretimiz 441'den 91'e düşer. Japonya. Çünkü biz Japonya'dan ithal ettiğimiz pek çok şeyle aslında burada üretip gönderiyoruz, ihracat yapıyoruz. Asıl bu denge önemli. Ne kadar ihra- ithalatımızın e, ihracata dönüştüğü rakamına bakmamız, bunu geliştirmeye çalışmamızın önemine inanıyorum. E, Japonya ile ilgili ee, çalışmak isteyen, bu konuda tecrübelerden faydalanmak isteyen herkese her zaman yardımcı olmaya hazırız. Biz İnce Holding olarak e, bu toplantıyı e, gerçekleştiren, emeği geçen herkese de e, çok teşekkür ediyorum. İyi günler diliyorum hepinize. Biz teşekkür ederiz Feri Hanım. Um, thank you for your valuable insight, um, sharing your experience and your approach to cultural differences and how to overcome them, um, find how to find a middle ground. Um, moving forward, um, our next session is about mergers and acquisitions, landscape and incentives. It's an important topic for those who would like to invest in Japan. And um, we have two speakers in this session. One of our speakers is Yutaka Kimura, a partner at our Tokyo office, and Seiji Tomimoto, a senior associate um, in our Tokyo office again. Yutaka has extensive experience in mergers, acquisitions, and general corporate matters, and regularly advises major Japanese and international companies, private equity funds, investment banks and startups on domestic and cross-border mergers and acquisitions transactions. Um, Seiji works on a variety of domestic and cross-border M&A transactions, joint ventures, corporate reorganization, employment matters, and commercial contracts. Seiji is also a member of our Turkey Japan Desk, developing Turkish desk side of, uh, of the Japan Desk uh, at our Tokyo office. I'm leaving the floor to um, Yutaka and Seiji. Yeah. That, thanks, Eli, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yutaka, and uh, I have my um, my colleague Seiji uh, together with me uh, to talk about M&A landscape and incentives uh, for investment uh, into Japan. Next slide, please. So in the first part, I'll talk a bit about M&A landscape, and uh, I will hand over to Seiji uh, to do a bit more deep dive into the trends, uh, and for him to also talk briefly about the incentives. So I'll, I'll spend a few minutes to give a bit of a kind of a snapshot of what the investment climate is uh, for foreign corporation, obviously including Turkish companies, uh, to invest in Japan. As you can see on the very top of this slide, Japanese manufacturers, as you may have seen on newspapers, um, they are changing their business portfolio very quickly by rigorously implementing portfolio management. 
I think a good example of this is Hitachi. So we see, I hope everyone has heard the name of Hitachi. Uh, obviously, they are a global conglomerate, and uh, they also have, uh, used to have, uh, a lot of listed subsidiaries uh, in Japan as well. During the past few years, Hitachi have decided to redesign their business in a, in a very kind of aggressive manner, so to say. So during the past uh, couple of years, they have started divesting a lot of their non-core, so-called non-core business, including uh, those multi-billion dollar listed subsidiaries with the brand name Hitachi. So they've been disposing you know, non-core businesses from their perspective uh, to um, you know, foreign corporations as well as global private equity funds. And at the same time, uh, they have been privatizing some of the um, subsidiaries that they seem, uh, they view as the, the core of their uh, business moving forward. And just taking this example of Hitachi, uh, how they have been transforming their business is that they are now focusing uh, to really concentrate on their uh, IoT platform, Internet of Things platform called Lumada. And they've been selecting uh, businesses uh, and group companies uh, to pick up those who you know, which can easily integrate uh, with their Lumada IoT platform and are disposing uh, those uh, group companies that are, you know, it, although it may be profitable, uh, may be a little too distant uh, from the, the core Lumada you know, business they have in mind uh, in the, the next uh, five or 10 years business plan. So that, that, that was one you know, good, good example, um, but you, you know, just as uh, Hitachi is, you know, in some industrial areas, such as, as I mentioned, electronic industries, which may involve you know, semiconductor LCD displays, you know, as everyone is aware, the global competition uh, has become very intense uh, during the past decade or two, uh, which is resulting in a lot of Japanese prominent branded companies uh, losing uh, global market shares significantly due to competitions you know, with, with uh, a lot of uh, global players around the world, including the US, China, Taiwan, Korea, to name a few. So th th th this is some, some you know, in, in some way a flip side uh, of the coin uh, in terms of what I've just explained, uh, uh, you know, as, as Hitachi as an example, um, but Japanese companies, they, they are really being forced uh, to put in a position to really seriously consider how they need to survive this very competitive uh, global economy. And from that perspective, there is a, there's been a lot of um, you know, investment opportunities in Japan, so to say. So I'm just picking up some of the, the representative uh, inbound uh, M&A transactions in Japan, uh, which has happened in the past couple of years, and some of which uh, we have also represented. So obviously Sharp, uh, as everyone knows, is a global brand. Uh, that has been acquired by Foxconn uh, Honghai, uh, which is a um, Taiwanese uh, multinational, uh, which happened five years ago. Um, Toshiba, obviously they are disposing of a lot of their business lines, uh, like the example of Hitachi, uh, but maybe in a bit of a, a slightly different context, uh, in a sense that they, they had a lot of uh, trouble business uh, that they had to dispose of uh, which made the, the, the financial condition of Toshiba very difficult, which led uh, to a lot of disposals, including this home appliance business, uh, which is, you know, uh, being eventually sold uh, to a Chinese investor. TV business as well, uh, after I think a, a competitive auction process, as was the case with the home appliance business, that has been sold uh, to Hisense. And the, 
you know, the, the Pioneer is another kind of example, uh, which has been acquired by a private equity fund um, called Bearing Private Equity Asia. And Seiji and myself has been working on a couple of actually Turkish uh, clients deal as well. I think we, we did not explicitly list it uh, in this list, uh, but we did act for Archilic uh, for their acquisition of the home appliance business of Hitachi, uh, which was announced last year. Uh, and uh, there's been uh, a few more, I think, attempts uh, by Turkish clients that we have represented uh, in the past few years to really uh, search, look for opportunities uh, in this context. And at the same time, as Seiji has spent some time in Istanbul uh, with our Turkish colleagues, uh, we are working uh, for a number of Japanese clients uh, for outbound uh, investments by Japanese clients into, Japan, uh, into, into Turkey as well. And before I kind of uh, turn over to Seiji, I think there's two key elements uh, in terms of the trend you see uh, from the investment climate I have just explained. I think one key element is brand. So as you can see from this list of uh, representative deals, you know, as, as, as people may be aware, all, all of these kind of Japanese multinational brands, they, they're known around the world. And um, the, you know, all, all of these transactions, they actually come together with the brand. And all the investors, they are interested, obviously in acquiring the business, uh, but also to acquire the brand as well. So how you, how you kind of um, make sure that you kind of get the right to use the brand in connection with the acquisition, that is one of the key elements uh, for the transactions uh, in this context. I think another key element uh, to these deals is that since these portfolio management by Japanese companies are happening uh, on a global basis, the target business seems to be spread across multi-jurisdictions. So the, the transactions uh, which are listed, you know, in this list as well, most of them are becoming far more complex uh, than the transactions uh, which involve one, two, or, you know, three jurisdictions. So there are a lot of efforts to be, to be, to be made, uh, obviously not only by the, the, the acquirer itself, uh, but the advisors as well to really get the deal through. So with that note, I think I'll hand over to Seiji uh, to do a bit more deep dive uh, on the M&A trends in the next slide. Over to you, Seiji. Uh, thank you, Yutaka. So uh, uh, let me briefly explain the uh, frequent issues which are seen you know, uh, when um, foreign uh, investors uh, acquire Japanese business, particularly uh, manufacturing business, I would say. So, uh, um, as Yuteka mentioned, you know, um, the much jurisdictional uh, cover transactions are more, you know, becoming more popular and popular. This is because, you know, as Yuteka said, um, Japanese manufacturers uh, need to select core business and dispose their non-core business. And uh, the business, existing business uh, lies not only within one company or not within one country, uh, rather it exists, you know, uh, across over the uh, jurisdictions and over the uh, several companies. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, such fiber transactions are becoming more popular and popular. And, uh, you know, uh, such cover transactions tend to be uh, complex because, you know, it, it normally contains uh, not only single share transfer or single asset transfer, but also, you know, uh, what more than one several uh, share transfers and asset transfers, or even, you know, a combination of uh, share transfer and asset transfer. Um, then, you know, uh, curved out business often depends on uh, original company or original headquarters 
in terms of uh, um, certain essential uh, functions, such as, uh, uh, for example, HR, um, legal, IT, for example, or even you know marketing activities. So, uh, uh, you know, it is necessary for the parties to enter into a transitional service agreement so that, you know, um, the buyer can uh, receive the necessary service for a certain period of time until the buyer's business puts in place the necessary um, stand along infrastructure. So in the transitional service agreement, you know, key discussion point is whether necessarily an appropriate service is uh, involved in the scope of the service. And also, you know, whether um, appropriate time duration is, you know, uh, ensured in the agreement. And sometimes, you know, uh, conversely, carved out business may include a, a essential back office function. In the case, you know, a reverse transitional service agreement will be executed. So that, you know, uh, the carved out business can provide a um, necessary service to uh, the seller side. So let me also briefly touch upon uh, brand licensing issues, which actually uh, Yutaka mentioned. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, brand is really key and core value for buyer. For example, when um, Hisense acquired the Toshiba TV business in 2017, Toshiba also um, gave a, uh, you know, a uh, brand license, global uh, brand license for a TV business to use a Toshiba name, uh, which lasts for uh, 40, not 14, 40 or zero years. So uh, um, for, uh, you know, uh, such a brand license or trademark license, the key discussion point is, you know, the duration of the time the buyer uh, would like to secure, you know, appropriately longer period to use a uh, um, brand name. And also, you know, uh, geographical area is important. Um, whether, you know, um, buyer's desirable uh, area is uh, secured within the agreement. Of course, you know, royalty rate is uh, um, another discussion point. So OEM arrangement, when a Japanese uh, manufacturing business is sold, um, seller sometimes decides to keep certain, um, keep a Japanese market, for example, a Japanese uh, manufacturing function uh, within its country or within its company. So in that case, for example, if, um, seller wants to keep a, a sales channel to Japanese market, um, there will be a, a OEM arrangement and uh, you know, buyer's business, um, which are, you know, manufacture business for um, the seller and the seller to, seller will sell the products uh, within Japanese market. Or sometimes, you know, um, seller, may want to keep uh, you know, it's a, a manufacturing function within Japan. In that case, you know, um, the product uh, would be sold to a uh, um, buyer's business and uh, seller and buyer would have uh, a distribution arrangement and uh, uh, buyers, you know, uh, carved out business would sell. Uh, such a, you know, uh, business under distribution arrangement. I would also, you know, uh, 
touch on a uh, uh, request for uh, ensuring job security. Um, under Japanese regulations, you know, it is not always very easy to dismiss the employees. As you know, um, they are relatively strongly protected by uh, uh, Japanese regulations. And also, you know, um, keeping job security of employees tend to be seen as a kind of social norm and uh, excessive uh, redundancy may be viewed as a um, negative factor. Um, although, you know, companies in bad financial situation due to, for example, COVID-19 situation has a, you know, need for an um, headcount reduction, such redundancy or reduction of headcount is more likely made as a um, solicitation of a um, voluntary retirement rather than just a, you know, um, dismissal. Um, in a beach transaction situation, keeping job security of employees is uh, sometimes uh, seen as one important factor of um, bid variation. And, uh, you know, keeping that in mind, um, buyers, foreign buyers may need to, you know, consider um, such a, you know, uh, security or keeping uh, uh, employees for a certain period of time. So, let me then move into our uh, um, incentives part. Well, I will quickly, you know, um, explain some instance of uh, um, incentives available for uh, foreign investors. Well, actually, please note that, you know, uh, there are just examples and uh, um, there are um, some other or more other um, in incentives available for foreign investors. So uh, um, you try to consult with an uh, uh, experienced lawyer, which has uh, you know, uh, sufficient knowledge about it. And also, you know, there are um, quite detailed uh, requirements for the uh, availability of uh, such incentives. So again, you know, you need to uh, um, seek for an adv advice from, uh, um, you know, appropriate lawyers that has uh, knowledge. So our uh, first example is uh, um, national strategic zones. So, uh, um, this incentives is available for uh, um, certain areas designated by law and by uh, um, local government. And this incentives is also specifically available for a certain uh, type of business, such as a uh, um, medical business, um, certain agricultural business, um, and uh, international relation, which may be a hotel business or assistance for foreign workers, and also uh, um, assistance for international conference, and also maybe IoT business. So for such a, you know, um, certain business and in certain area, if uh, the, you know, business plan of the, um, company is approved by the local government, um, the company can enjoy a deduction of 20% of uh, its uh, corporate income tax for a maximum five years. There is also incentives for uh, um, local hubs. Um, if, you know, uh, foreign investors open up um, entity or office uh, in a um, certain local area, 
which does not include Tokyo, by the way. You know, uh, it's more like uh, um, incentives for companies to open the business in a uh, uh, local area. So uh, uh, under certain requirements, uh, five-year depreciation of 25% for 50% for newly opening hubs would be enjoyed. Or, you know, uh, investment acquiring cost of uh, multiplied by 7%, or sometimes 4% for newly opening hubs. And also uh, uh, employment related tax credits is available when uh, uh, the business open an uh, uh, entity in the office in a local area or uh, transfer its uh, business function from um, the central Tokyo, for example, to uh, you know, such a designated local area. There is another example of uh, uh, R&D tax credit system. Um, Japanese government is promoting and accelerating, you know, R&D activities, uh, you know, more uh, often uh, conducted in Japan and uh, wants the companies to create innovation. So uh, if you know uh, certain uh, designated R and D activities is made, um, up to forty percent of uh, uh, tax credit can be enjoyed. And uh, um, also, you know, um, there is some uh, special visa for. Uh, uh, highly skilled foreign professionals or uh, foreign nationals related to uh, uh, startups. So uh, if a foreign employee is um, you know, approved as a highly skilled uh, professional, um, evaluating it's his uh, or her educational background or work history or salary, um, they can enjoy uh, extension of a visa period, for example, and also uh, um, easy conversion to a uh, um, permanent visa. And uh, there are another benefit for uh, their spouse and uh, uh, spouse can be e e easily get, uh, you know, visa to work in Japan as well. And also uh, um, that approved to foreign professionals can also invite its, uh, uh, you know, mate from a home country or under certain requirements, uh, they can also live with their parents if certain requirements met. So, as, you know, such kind of uh, variety of uh, um, uh, incentives are given to uh, uh, the foreign professionals. Let me just finally uh, briefly touch upon the um, sandbox. Uh, in case you'd like to conduct business activities uh, which utilize uh, you know, new technology or new business models, but uh, they conflict with uh, existing Japanese regulations, um, you can apply to conduct operations as uh, test operations. And uh, you will be approved, if approved, you will be allowed to conduct that business activities for a limited time. Sometimes, you know, you don't know whether um, the new business model is allowed under Japanese regulations or not. In that case, you can apply to uh, the government and uh, ask whether it is, uh, you know, lawful or not. And that's a gray zone elimination system. And if you use this system, uh, governments uh, basically needs to reply within one month. There is also, you know, a special arrangement for uh, an, on a corporate basis. And if you are approved, you know, that approved corporate uh, would have certain exemption of regulations and uh, 
carry out the new business models uh, under approved requirements. So uh, this is uh, the end of our presentation. Um, although it is you know, a quick and snapshot, uh, if you have any questions or any opinion, uh, you can contact us freely. So uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Yutaka and Seiji, for um, the informative and enlightening session. I hope this will provide some guidance to especially Turkish companies who would like to invest in Japan, but do not know where to start or do not know anything about the market. Um, another important topic we would like to touch upon is renewable energy. It is one of the hottest topics we all need to hear. Um, Naoko Eguchi will be our speaker and Nigar Gökman will be moderating the session. Uh, Nick is a partner of the Banking and Finance Group and the co-head of the Renewable and Clean Energy Group at Baker McKenzie's Tokyo office, uh, focusing on project finance and infrastructure related matters. Nikyar is the head of Energy Mining and Infrastructure Practice Group at Essen Attorney Partnership, uh, aka Baker McKenzie Istanbul. Uh, and Nigar has a solid record advising local and multinational companies with a special focus on the development of projects in energy mining and infrastructure sectors. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli, for introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nigar Gökman, and uh, as Eli said, together with my esteemed colleague, Nick, uh, we will be discussing about renewable energy investment opportunities in Japan uh, during the next 20 minutes. So let me share my screen for the presentation. I think now you can see it. Okay, then uh, first I would like to give a brief information about our subject first, then uh, we can proceed with our questions and answers with Nick. And uh, I would like to start with uh, energy transition trends and new climate targets. Because, you know, based on energy transition trends, electrification of the transportation, especially transportation and industrial sectors are required now. And uh, the electricity to be used in that sectors uh, should be generated by the renewable energy-based generation facilities to meet with the new climate targets declared by certain governments uh, and also EU. Uh, so based on this potential in the renewable energy demand, uh, renewable energy investments are also accelerating today. Uh, after stating this, I also would like to give a brief information about the status in Turkey, so that when I ask my questions, Nick can make some comparisons uh, between uh, Japan and Turkey in that regard. Uh, renewable energy investments are Turkey is uh, um, renewable energy investments um, in Turkey are also increasing, you know, in line with global trends, and the government continues to support uh, the investments by providing hidden tariff support and also by providing an opportunity to generate electricity without a license for, you know, self-consumption and smaller projects. Uh, but concerning hidden tariff, I would like to note that. Uh, you know, the projects to be commissioned until the end of this month will be subject to US dollar prices, while the projects to be commissioned after the end of this month will be subject to Turkish lira prices indexed to foreign currency. So uh, I can say that the projects, the future renewable energy investments in Turkey, it seems that they will be subject to a certain amount of uh, foreign currency risk. Uh, and um, as an another development I can mention about renewable energy certification system, Turkey recently introduced its national certification system so that uh, renewable energy generation and consumption can now be certified by a national certification system in Turkey. But uh, on that point, I also want to say that uh, IREC, which is an international certification system, uh, is still being used in Turkey. 
so lastly, I can also note that uh, in Turkey, we started to discuss, but not started to use, to started, to, uh, started to discuss uh, about corporate PPA opportunities for uh, financing of new renewable energy investments. So I can say that Turkish investors are familiar with investments and relevant incentives, models, and uh, you know um, trends and support mechanism regarding renewable energy uh, projects. So uh, Nick, on that point, can we get your views uh, on the renewable energy potential in Japan and in conjunction with you know trends, support mechanisms, and projects in the pipeline, maybe? Thank you, Naiga. Um, hi, uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for giving me opportunity uh, to speak about um, Japanese renewable uh, investment opportunities. Um, first of all, uh, I, I must say I, I am a fan of uh, Magnificent Centuries, the Turkish TV drama. At the time of the work at home period, I was almost watch, watch at home situation. I, I went through all programs <laughs> um, in a short period of time, day and night. Uh, it's, it's great. I like um, Hurem. Um, uh, I, I think uh, her, her attitude, never give up spirit is very important in a difficult time like COVID-19. So we should learn the Hurem spirits. Right, um, let me um, uh, introduce uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, support system. Uh, can, can you move on to the next page? Right, um, uh, I, I gave you um, uh, the basic uh, number the population, uh, Turkey, uh, 82 million, and uh, Japan is 126 million. And uh, electric capacity, uh, uh, 97 and 220, uh, 292. And the solar power, uh, Japan is 60 giga, and uh, the Turkey is a 7.1. Uh, and uh, wind power, the Turkey, is ahead of Japan, uh, 9.6 giga, and Japan is 4.7. So let me explain why we have a such large uh, the solar power uh, uh, station uh, in operation at the moment. The Japanese government introduced a feed-in tariff system, which is similar to a Turkish feed-in tariff system. Uh, it was a uh, uh, 12, uh, 2012 uh, July was the first day of the implementation. And uh, at first, the feeding tariff price was uh, 40 yen, almost 36 US cents per kilowatt hour. So it's a very high tariff because Japanese government want to have uh, the huge investment in the solar power. Uh, so that's why uh, the government introduced a very high tariff uh, for, to attract the overseas investment and the Japanese investment into a solar market. Uh, it was very success. Uh, of course, uh, every year the feeding tariff decreased 10% each year, but the uh, uh, initial high tariff attracted uh, overseas players a lot into a Japanese market. Uh, we call it the uh, kind of uh, the gold rush to Japan. Um, so that's why uh, we saw uh, many foreign players in the Japanese market, European players and uh, American players and uh, Asian players, uh, the Singaporeans and the Thai companies, especially Thai companies are very active in the Japanese solar power market. And they are still active. Uh, we are working with our Thai, uh, Baker Makeji Thai office 
uh, to help uh, Thai companies to invest into a Japanese solar market. And another uh, the good uh, system is uh, the government provided the model PPA, a power purchase agreement, uh, which is standardized and the bankable uh, uh, P, uh, power purchase agreement. So we don't need to negotiate the power purchase agreement each time. It's a, a standard bankable model. So that's why uh, Japanese financial institutions are happy to lend to the solar power uh, system, uh, which gives uh, 40 and at first for 20 years uh, fixed price. Um, so it's very stable. And the purchaser of taker are the Japanese grid companies uh, that with a high credit rate. Uh, so no, no worry about the bankruptcy risk. Uh, so that was a, a great system um, uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's uh, going, went down 10% each. Uh, now it is uh, 11 uh, uh, yen, uh, which is about um, 10 cents, uh, 10 US cents per kilowatt hour. So uh, it's not so attractive. Um, uh, compared to the initial year. But uh, as uh, Naiga uh, explained, the, the huge demand on the renewable power uh, is coming in Japan because we are facing a carbon tax in Europe and um, the disclosure requirement for the renewable policy. Uh, the Japanese uh, manufacturers uh, faced uh, the the necessity to procure the renewable power. Uh, otherwise, uh, they are excluded from the supply chain and they are uh, excluded for uh, export to uh, European or US companies, uh, uh, uh, South and North America. So uh, it's a huge um, the, uh, demand uh, coming from a user side. So that's why uh, the Japanese um, uh, investment into um, the renewable power uh, still continues. Uh, and um, uh, uh, uh, now uh, we have uh, um, the offshore wind uh, power uh, development, uh, which is a uh, new, uh, but the Japan is surrounded by the, the, the sea. Uh, and uh, we can secure the large space for offshore wind. Uh, the one size for the offshore wind is uh, 350 uh, megawatt uh, minimum. And uh, we have a round one uh, auction uh, at the moment. Um, the first winner uh, was um, uh, announced last week, uh, which is our client. So we are very happy to see our client uh, won uh, uh, the auction. Um, so, uh, uh, so at the moment, um, the, uh, similar to other countries, uh, re renewable demand is so high in Japan. Thank you. Thank you for the information, Nick. So uh, it's, it seems that Japan has a huge potential for solar power and, uh, and try to increase its wind power uh, installed capacity as uh, both based on offshore projects and onshore projects, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's good to hear that hidden tariff incentives still continue uh, and maybe the uh, maybe not now, but the investors uh, can also consider PPA option in the near future, a couple of years maybe, I can understand. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, that's a good point. Um, the corporate PPA uh, is a big trend in the US and Europe. And um, it's coming to Japan uh, because uh, the feed-in tariff is now uh, 10 cents per uh, kilowatt hour, uh, US dollars 10 cents. So it, it's uh, very low uh, at the moment. And uh, um, the, the, the feeding tariff system 
will uh, shift to a uh, feed-in premium system uh, from 2022, uh, which is a market-linked um, the system. Of course, you can get the premium later uh, for the balance, but uh, it's linked to the market. Uh, so uh, it affects the, uh, the fluctuation. So that's why uh, if a good off-taker provide a 20-year purchase under the corporate PPA system uh, with a fixed price, uh, that corporate PPA system may be better uh, for a developer uh, to get um, the stable uh, cash flow and uh, easy to uh, provide, uh, uh, easy to obtain uh, project finance from uh, financiers. So the corporate PPA uh, may be uh, next, um, the good, uh, the, the opportunities uh, for all overseas players. Thank you very much, Nick, for your uh, answer. So my other question will, uh, to you will be that, uh, you know, in general, uh, what would your recommendations be for Turkish businesses, um, you know, seeking investment opportunities in Japan? How should they prepare themselves? Sure. Um, can you turn over the next page? Um, I, I'm sorry, it's a very small character, so we can share the, the slide later. Um, so uh, the, the one opportunity is, is uh, the, again, the feeding tariff for a feeding premium or corporate PPA, uh, greenfield uh, investment uh, into a Japanese uh, renewable sector. But another opportunity is a secondary transaction. Uh, you can purchase uh, the, the company uh, who does uh, renewable power. Uh, at the moment, a uh, secondary transaction is also booming. Um, the low risk uh, and uh, of course low return, but uh, it's a stable uh, cash flow. And you may uh, own sell uh, the company to another investors. So that kind of a, a secondary transaction uh, is also opportunities. And um, uh, Japanese companies are now uh, looking overseas investments. Uh, so maybe in Turkey or, or in Africa, uh, the Japanese company are uh, happy to invest to overseas uh, renewable or space. Um, that may be uh, another opportunity for uh, Turkish companies, uh, joint venture with uh, Japanese companies in Africa. For example, uh, for example, in Kenya, uh, the Japanese companies are investing in the solar power uh, projects. And um, uh, I'm sure the Turkish construction companies are very strong and they have a good capability for um, the construction. And uh, they know the African market. So that may be a good combination of uh, Japanese and the Turkish uh, the uh, renewable uh, investment in a third country. Of course, uh, in a Turkish market is also an opportunity. Can, can you turn over the next slide? Uh, uh, sorry, one more. Um, in, in fact, uh, we helped uh, Japanese companies uh, uh, in a change uh, invest into a Turkish uh, solar uh, market. Uh, the energy change established um, Japan Energy Fund, uh, which is a fund to invest into the overseas uh, renewable power. Um, uh, can you turn over the slide? Uh, this, uh, this is in, in um, the Turkish Zenizil uh, Zenizil province. Zenizil. Yeah. Uh, it's a 13 megawatt. Uh, it's a start with a small project, but uh, they are planning to uh, expand the big, big investment in the near future. So uh, this is a good example uh, for um, the, that uh, investment into uh, Turkey. So we can invest both sides into Japan or into Turkey or into uh, third countries. So we, I think we have a big opportunity 
uh, for uh, the renewable uh, space uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. So uh, we can say that, you know, uh, Japan may be a very attractive destination for Turkish investors in terms of renewable energy projects then. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So we welcome overseas investment into Japan. Please help us to develop further. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank you much, very much, both. Thank you, Nick and Nigar. Um, renewable energy is something obviously we need to keep an eye on as we will be hearing more about it in the upcoming years. Um, and it's a good opportunity to invest in Japan, obviously. Um, moving forward from renewable energy to digital age technology and personal data session. Um, from our Tokyo office, we will be hosting a speaker, Kensaku Takase. Uh, he's a partner and the head of Tokyo office's IP tech group. Uh, and who, he focuses on intellectual property law, media law, and information technology law since 1999. Ken has been heavily involved in significant IT deals, including those involving outsourcing, licensing, and cloud-based solutions. He regularly advises on data protection and data security issues for global companies in many industries, including medical device and pharmaceutical companies. I will be moderating this session. Uh, what do I have to do with the session? Uh, I have also been working on technology and data protection related matters for 16 years now. Um, shall we start, Ken? Absolutely. Thanks, Yule. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you. So uh, Japan has a dedicated data protection law, the Act on Protection of Personal Information, and it is recently declared as a safe country by the EU. Uh, the law was amended in June 2020. Certain limitations were removed on the extraterritorial application of the Act, and the amendments are expected to enter into force in 2022. What are the general rules that apply to data processing activities? Okay, um, so maybe I could give you a little bit of background with regard to you know, Japan's privacy law and how it's developed. Um, Japan's privacy law has developed quite independently from the privacy laws of many other jurisdictions um, and I think if you know companies look at what's happening in the Asia Pacific region they'll see that there's a lot of um, countries who are trying to replicate what's happening in the EU they're copy pasting the GDPR into their own laws um, but Japan hasn't taken that approach and while it's taken some of the principles which are established in the OECD. Uh, it has a very unique flavor. Um, so Japan's privacy laws were established a fair amount of time ago. So in 2003, they first came into force. Um, but I think it's important for Turkish companies to keep in mind that despite the law being fairly long standing, that it has no fines or significant financial penalties being imposed upon um, companies ever. So it wouldn't be wrong to say that Japan's actually a fairly business friendly uh, country in that sense. Um, so I think you, you, you see something quite similar in the EU, for example, you have different countries um, being, you know, taking different approaches, even with the EU. Um, having the GDPR, so you have countries like Italy and Spain and Germany being quite strict in enforcing uh, penalties, um, whereas, you know, other countries are a little bit quieter. Uh, so I, I often think that Japan is quite similar perhaps to the UK. It wants to be seen as a very business-friendly jurisdiction. It doesn't want to, you know, keep uh, business away because of its privacy laws or um, controls over privacy. Um, so, in that sense, it's very flexible in its arrangement. Um, but having said that, you know, as privacy laws are being updated, they are becoming more and more aligned to the EU situation in the GDPR, which is one of the reasons why Japan has been actually acknowledged as having adequate uh, protection compared with the, uh, with the EU. Um, another big development is in 2016, they actually had a um, authority established, which is 
specifically focused on data protection. Uh, so until then, they didn't, uh, which made kind of enforcement uh, quite difficult. And a lot of companies actually uh, self-enforced whenever there was a breach, they would actually uh, pay consumers um, for the data breach just on their own um, prerogative without actually having a penalty enforced upon them. So that wasn't a very good situation, um, both for consumers or for, um, for companies. So the authority uh, and its introduction was, I think, quite a, a welcome thing. Um, so the, the authority first started off with um, a focus on educating the public. And again, this is a very similar approach to what, what you see in the EU with um, education being where um, the authorities start when they're first established and is gradually moving into more of a focus on setting the finer regulations and uh, developing uh, future amendments to the existing privacy law. Uh, so there's um, a lot of, uh, I guess, development in this area in recent years. Um, it's uh, you know, the, the, the recent amendments that you were referring to um, are looking a lot more like uh, the, the GDPR in terms, of, in terms of nature and what they require. So I'd be happy to, to talk through those with you, Eli, if you want, wish, or if you want to ask a, a different question, I'd be happy to address that. Sure, I, I have a lot of questions in mind today. Um, I'm not sure if we can answer all of them, but it was interesting to learn that Japan didn't start with copying and pasting GDPR related rules into its um, own jurisdiction, which is really interesting because it really has to be like similar at certain points if you are a country that provides adequate level of you know, protection. Um, so related to my first question, so if you were to give a couple of tips to a Turkish company that will process personal data of individuals in Japan, what would they be? Um, so maybe just addressing your first point with regard to um, how Japan was actually recognized as being adequate. Um, I think that's a really good point. And when you certainly line up the GDPR or you know the, the previous directive alongside Japan's privacy law, you'll see probably less in common um, than you'd expect. Um, so I think you know, the approach that was taken was it was treated as a bit of a trade type of a deal. So um, you know privacy was part one of the the trade elements which was sort of negotiated between the Japanese government and the EU Commission alongside many other things uh, to do with trade. So the reality is that, you know, the laws aren't similar. Uh, when, you know, the, the, I guess the threshold isn't similarity, it's more adequacy, uh, is it adequate? And in that sense, I think, you know, the Japanese privacy law um, does provide a lot of, um, you know, adequacy in that sense. Um, but having said that, you know, when you do transfer personal data from the EU to Japan, uh, you can't just simply transfer it. Uh, despite there being this mutual recognition, you still have to have a contract in place, um, which um, kind of boosts up the, uh, the Japanese position. So it's actually more at the, the uh, EU level. So in, in a sense, it's, it's kind of recognizing that it's not ad adequate, um, but yeah, it's a little bit political. So I won't, won't talk any further on, on that particular point. Um, but going to your, your question as to what you think, you know, what Turkish firms and Turkish companies should do uh, when um, setting up in Japan, what, what's particularly important. Um, one thing that I think companies should focus on is their privacy policies. Privacy policies are really important in Japan. Um, you often don't need consent to process personal information. Um, if you have set out clearly how you intend to process the personal data. Um, if there's sensitive personal data or you're going to transfer the personal data to a third party or overseas, then you do need to get consent. Um, but otherwise you can often just have uh, how you intend to use addressed in a publicly disclosed notice or policy. Um, so it's important to make sure that your 
privacy policy is compliant with Japanese data protection laws uh, because the law here is actually quite strict um, and with the new amendments coming into force, you actually need to provide more information as a data controller. Um, and some of the requirements are actually beyond uh, the requirements under the GDPR. So just because you have a GDPR compliant privacy policy doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work uh, in Japan. The other thing that we recommend with regard to the policies is because the Japanese consumers don't um, necessarily understand and read uh, other languages, uh, English even. So uh, in that sense, it's best to have your policies uh, translated into Japanese and double checked by um, a Japanese qualified lawyer just to make sure that they're compliant as well. Um, there's quite a few other things that you need to keep in mind as well. Um, there's no distinction in Japan between data controllers and data processes. Uh, you know, there are other countries which also don't have that distinction. Um, so that can make it a little bit challenging when you're relying upon um, transfer agreements from other countries like the uh, EU standard clause contracts. They don't necessarily fit, you know, that, that well with um, the Japanese privacy law. Um, so again, you just need to have that reviewed and reflect the position of uh, the Japanese data protection laws. Um, yeah, I, I guess that also ties into the cross-border transfer point. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was about to ask that too, but before, before moving with that question, um, so Turkey has passed its dedicated data protection law in 2016. And as far as we know, the Turkish government is in discussions with the EU uh, in terms of, you know, being declared as a safe country and all. Uh, I wonder how many years um, has it been since, you know, um, Japan started discussions with the EU? How long the process of being declared as a um, safe country uh, took? Like, I heard it was seven years, but if, if you know that from the top of your head, uh, I'd be happy to know. I, I doubt it's seven years. I mean, seven years, if you calculated that backwards, would be before the GDPR even, I think. So uh, I doubt it's, it's seven years. Um, uh, like under the directive before the, um, before the GDPR, there were whitelisted countries already on, on the, on the mm -hmm. list. Um, and Japan is really the first country that was recognized after the GDPR came into force. Now, we had a, a webinar um, a couple of weeks back for, um, for a Japanese audience in which we had uh, a person from the um, European Data Protection Board actually participate, which was a, which was a great insight. And uh, there was a lot of discussion about adequacy and, and uh, issues surrounding um, cross-border transfers of personal data. And he mentioned that the discussions took place over the course of two years. So not that long, really. Um, you know, from what I've heard, as I mentioned earlier, there was, you know, a lot of trade discussions that were going on at the same time. And Japan looked at what was happening with, at the, you know, with the US with regard to um, the safe harbor being um, dismissed, you know, under SHREMS 1, and then the privacy shield being um, attacked and removed under SHREMS 2. Uh, so those are, you know, European um, cases. Uh, so they looked at that and said, OK, we don't want to end up in a situation like uh, the US has with these kind of uh, side agreements. They wanted a proper um, arrangement, proper treaty in place between uh, the EU and, uh, and Japan um, and therefore proceeded on, on that basis. And I think they've done very well um, to get this, this mutual recognition. Um, but when, when we heard from the uh, person from the European Data Protection Board, he mentioned South Korea as being the next country that was most likely to get yeah. adequately recognized. Um, he also mentioned, um, you know, other countries who were in discussions, um, but he said that, you know, that they were still a little bit um, further down the list in, in terms of, you know, um, being good to know. <laughs> 
Perfect. So um, thank you. Uh, that was really very helpful. I thought that those discussions between Japan and EU went back to directive. Um, so I think it's, um, you know, uh, if it doesn't take that long, not as long as seven years, um, that was good to know. Uh, about the cross-border data transfers uh, you mentioned. So how does it work currently in Japan? So if it's between EU and Japan, um, then it's very straightforward. You can rely upon the adequacy just with those contractual tweaks that I mentioned earlier. Um, if it's outside of Japan, so we, we were talking about, you know, um, transfers here, we're talking about transfers of Japanese data subject data outside of Japan. So when that happens, then you either need to rely upon uh, the adequacy decision for the EU uh, or some sort of contractual arrangement. Um, now, Japan, unlike the EU, does not have standard clause contracts. So you do need to enter into something that's similar to standard clause contracts and they haven't published anything, but um, generally we've found that standard clause contracts uh, typically work. So um, I think most you know, Turkish companies that have a, um, a global reach will probably have some form of intra-group agreement and what we typically do is we'll have the SCCs, the European Standard Clause contracts, being um, a key part of those uh, agreements with what we call Japan riders. So they'll just slightly tweak the, the SCCs to make um, things work for Japan. And those riders aren't typically uh, that long uh, or sophisticated. So we've done this many times, so we can easily um, help there. Perfect. We're almost out of time, but I want to squeeze in one more question, uh, which I think might be insightful for the participants. Um, so you, you have been helping with uh, many companies, um, foreign companies that invest in Japan, that do business in Japan. Uh, so you have this vast experience about what the, you know, possible challenges could be for them while working in Japan. Uh, especially in terms of data protection. Could you give us a little bit of insight about this? Sure. Um, so, so overall, I, I think most companies can operate quite smoothly in Japan without worrying too much about data protection laws. But in particular industries, I think you know, the challenges can be slightly greater, particularly for the healthcare industry or medical device industry, where there's collection of sensitive personal data. Um, the, the challenges there aren't necessarily Japan's data protection laws, but more the other regulations that are associated uh, with control of medical information. So there's some fairly outdated laws there and regulations there um, that uh, I guess um, need to be considered. And that touches upon the second challenge is that Japanese companies can often be quite conservative in their approach. So if there's doubt, they prefer not to proceed. Um, they, they are very risk adverse. And this isn't a necessarily a very easy part of the law to, to understand. It, it can be quite technical, it can become quite challenging. Um, so often we find that there needs to be a lot of education, not only on the part of the, um, the, you know, the, the Turkish company or a uh, you know, foreign company wanting to do business in Japan, but also of Jap Japan domestic uh, companies whose um, customer data or patient data you'd like to utilize. So there can be that two-way um, uh, education process, which can take a little bit more time and be challenging uh, every now and then. Yeah, it is, it is the same in Turkey uh, in terms of, you know, health data uh, is subject to very strict rules in Turkey as well. Uh, so it's a bit of a process, I guess. Um, thank you very much for everything. Uh, we're out of time. Unfortunately, I could talk about this all day. Um, hoping that this session was helpful and thanks to you personally, it was to me as a lawyer who works in data protection related matters. Uh, also, it's always good to know what other countries have been doing in terms of um, you know, data protection as they are fast spreading throughout the world. Many countries are passing their own data protection laws. Um, thanks again for participating. Thanks, Hila. Our last panel before the closing remarks is also about a great topic. It's uh, benefits of investing in Japan, difference of working culture between Turkey and Japan. 
and I'm pretty sure our speaker and our moderator will also uh, let you know the common ground on how to overcome this. Um, our speaker today is Aileen Tulay Özden. She is a board member of Doruk Otomasyon and general manager of ProManage. She is in technology sector working on IoT-based MOM systems, AI, and AR matters and spreading them internationally. Um, Duygu Turgut is our moderator for the session. She's a partner in the M&A mergers and acquisitions practice at Baker McKenzie Istanbul, a beloved colleague. She will be moderating the session. Duygu focuses her practice on national and cross-border M&A transactions using stock asset and merger structures, joint ventures and privatizations, and she has extensive experience on Japanese companies, mergers, and acquisitions transactions. So you go. I'm deferring to you on this. Thank you, Eli, for the introduction. Um, and welcome all uh, DAIC members. It's a great pleasure for us to meet you here today, even though we are on a virtual platform again. Uh, we enjoy to be with you following a roller coaster year marked by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as uh, Eli explained, I'm a responsible partner for mergers and acquisitions at SN Attorney Partnership, Baker McKenzie Istanbul. So I am well used to work with Japanese clients looking for investments in Turkey. Uh, but today, our main focus is the other way around. We will have a closer look at the ways of doing business in Japan. In our session, we will discuss about the differences in working cultures in Turkey and in Japan, in Japan together with my esteemed guest, Aylin Hanım. Uh, Aylin Hanım, uh, you will be mainly sharing your observations and provide us insights during our session. But first, I would like to ask you for a short introduction about yourself and your story, uh, your company's story linked with doing business in Japan. Um, hi to everyone. Vaktashiva uh, Aileen Des, Yoroshiko Onegaishimas. I would like to express my feelings at first, um, just this much uh, Japanese sentences and um, declarations. Uh, nice to meet you and thank you for this um, meeting. Um, my name is Aileen Özden. I am one of the founders of Doruk Automation and Software Company. Uh, our company is a technology and R&D company, which is working on digitalization for manufacturing companies. Um, and we are using IT technologies. Uh, we are 23 years of a uh, company and our main products are IoT-based manufacturing operations management softwares and hardware. Uh, we are um, servicing uh, for um, some of the pioneer companies worldwide. And we have lots of Japanese companies also. Uh, as Doruk, um, our main users, which are manufacturing companies, are benchmark companies in their um, group of manufacturing factories worldwide. And the main idea uh, why companies are using our solution is, uh, the main idea, the companies are implementing um, a kind of Japanese manufacturing management methodologies like TPM, uh, like TQM, lean manufacturing, lean management are some of these um, methodologies which they are using. And um, worldwide different um, kind of companies, different uh, companies from all over the world are using these methodologies and our solutions are making a kind of automation, digitalization of um, making these implementations. But all the things are IoT based. Of course, we are using AI and other related technologies on our solutions. And in our users, we have uh, some Japanese companies also like Aishin, Nitto, Denso, YKK, JSUASA, etc. And um, at some part of our journey, we have decided to be worldwide global company. And um, we have put up some targets for our company. And the first one is, um, we have established a United States entity, uh, which is a kind of headquarter of our global operations. And the second target was 
to open an entity in Japan. Why Japan? Because um, as I tried to explain, Japanese um, style of manufacturing corporations management is very common. And when you think about smart manufacturing, digital digitalization, um, lean manufacturing is a kind of very important tool to convert the machine to, to convert the manufacturers, the companies um, to lean management uh, companies. Because of this reason, we thought that Japanese um, way of thinking uh, for production is very common in Japan, and Japanese companies, Japanese manufacturers would like to use our solutions um, in general. Because of this reason, we put our target to have a branch in Japan, um, the target was 2019. But um, until uh, before telling this story, I would like to express that um, personally me and lots of my colleagues from my company has went to Japan uh, to get some trainings about Japanese style of manufacturing uh, from uh, HIDA, A-O-T-S, Japanese, um, agency to give some trainings about Japanese culture are providing some trainings. Lots of people from my company, uh, we have sent some of them. I personally went to Japan and I really liked Japan. Um, also, I have sent my son, my daughter to Japan to learn about Japanese culture. It was, um, there was a training about uh, the subject. And also they stayed in Japan for a while, more than two weeks, I think they, they liked it. Uh, my daughter, who is also a computer engineer, uh, she, be, she began to attend Japanese lessons to begin to speak Japanese. Uh, the sentences which I expressed to you at the beginning of my speech were uh, from my daughter, she taught me. Uh, and then uh, we really, uh, like Japanese um, country, people, uh, style of living, uh, and in my opinion, it's very close to Turkish uh, style of living indeed. Um, even though we are a kind of European company, uh, the main behavior, be behaviors are um, quite common. Um, we really liked Japanese people, we really liked to work together with them. Uh, and when we have decided to open an entity in Japan, we were planning to open an entity, uh, of course. But um, we were lucky that at a fair, at an exhibition in Hanover, Hanover Messe, our Japanese partner found us and we have es established a partnership in Japan. Uh, we are not personally in Japan as Zurich Automation and Software, uh, but we have a partner, uh, we have a distributor in Japan and working together with them. Uh, it is very um, comfort comfortable, of course. Uh, I will uh, try to explain the details again, but uh, as the um, summary of the uh, answer of the question of Duygu is, um, because of our um, focus, business focus, we were working on um, the same habits, the same manufacturing management habits with Japanese manufacturers. Because of this reason, uh, we, we were invited to be in Japan and to help uh, to support Japanese manufacturers with our solutions. Everything begins like this. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, today we have audience here from different sectors of businesses, most probably with a common agenda of running their business in successfully in Japan, uh, now already or in the future. As a lawyer working with different clients from different countries, I was lucky enough to observe and understand, uh, especially if we talk about the Japanese clients, their expectations and also their approach to existing issues in a close manner. Because I believe understanding the culture and recognizing the differences, differences is one of the most important steps to deal with a business in a totally different environment. So in that sense, my question to you, Aylin would be the following. As a business person already taking steps 
um, forward to a successful business in Japan. What do you think would be the most considerable elements to understand the environment and working culture in Japan based on your experiences? In my opinion, um, trust and um, respect uh, is the most important two issues. Uh, Japanese people in general are very respectful people. They respect themselves, they respect you, they respect customers. And in my opinion, um, everything has been triggered with this respect. Um, they are very nice, um, trustable, respectful, uh, and kind people. Uh, and because of this reason, they are um, acting very smoothly they are um, thinking too much uh, and making lots of plans and um, acting very smoothly. I believe that this is coming because of the um, main um, idea is respect. In, this is my opinion, of course. By the way, I would like to express that our partner company is almost 70, 70 years old company. Uh, even though it is quite an um, experienced company, it's being managed by a young and modern Japanese team. Uh, because of this reason, maybe our partner is a kind of modern style of Japanese uh, partner. Uh, because of this reason, uh, I will explain uh, my experiences, but uh, we are working with a modern style of Japanese company. Uh, which may give another idea to you. Uh, the manager of the company is very visionary and um, trying to transform the company to a um, new age and uh, the IT operations, uh, software, AI, augmented reality and related um, technologies are very important for this company and they have a very wide range of manufacturers in their ecosystem. And um, they have a global vision. There are lots of uh, foreign um, employees who are working for this company. And it's a kind of global company which is living in Japan. Uh, and this is very exciting for us also. Uh, for example, with them, uh, we made a world lancement of our new product. Um, even though um, they are... Um, new style of Japanese company, they are uh, showing all this interesting and uh, respectful um, uh, view of the uh, vision of the other companies, of course. They are making um, really um, smooth action plans. Smooth action plans means um, they respect their customers, um, customer success or customer um, experience is very important for them because of this reason it's a kind of double chain point for us. They are thinking about every, every small uh, item of the plan very detailedly and uh, asking, requiring very good uh, points from us. While we are working with our Japanese partner, uh, we feel that we have to finish uh, some of our homeworks very uh, carefully uh, not to feel uncomfortable with them because they are quite planned uh, and they, they respect um, customer issues. They, they respect um, how to uh, provide something uh, to the market uh, very carefully because of this reason it's a very nice double checkpoint for us. Um, in regarding to Japanese environment, uh, digitalization is very popular um, and IoT data collection, um, artificial intelligence solutions are very popular in the Japan um, manufacturing, manufacturing uh, market, uh, but um, operational management issues are being made by hand manually. Um, this is a general habit in Japan. They feel much more comfortable when they make something manually. They believe that they can 
realize better Japanese people prefers to make lots of operational management issue manually, as I um, see. And um, our uh, partner has made some search research, market habit research, and to understand um, which kind of um, challenge can we can we can we face uh, to apply this. This is also another advantage, in my opinion. Uh, when you work with a local company, uh, they know the market, they know the um, market challenge, they know the um, needs of target customers. And because of uh, this information, this knowledge, uh, your operations are being much more um, uh, easy and target uh, pointed pointed to the target. Because of this reason, um, in Japan, we recognize something that um, manufacturing execution system and manufacturing operations management system usage are not much common. We have to establish some awareness campaigns. We have to implement lots of POCs to customers together with our partner. And right now, for example, we are um, implementing some solutions, but we are also trying to uh, eliminate such as um, challenges in the market, which uh, they found for us. And um, in my opinion, it's a very um, nice and smooth uh, way uh, of doing business in Japan to find a partner. Um, I suggest this for the people who would like to invest in Japan for the beginning. I would like to express something else, especially in Silicon Valley, um, there is a new approximation as lean startup approximation. You have to provide a product, you have to product, produce a product and provide this to the market, uh, get some responses. Uh, regarding to this, the responses change the product, change the services and uh, develop it. Uh, before finishing everything, you can provide some of the products to the market and you can change the uh, specifications regarding to feedbacks. Um, this is the way, this is a new approximation in Silicon Valley, but unfortunately, for example, this is not appropriate for Japan because um, Japan's, uh, before uh, providing something to the market, uh, Japan people would like to feel uh, com comfortable and confident. Uh, to feel confident, uh, they have to finish all necessary preparations. Uh, and um, when they go to the customer, um, there shouldn't be any missing point. Uh, of course, we respect it a lot. Uh, it's a very precious approximation. Um, but you have to finish everything. It takes time. Uh, if you would like to enter market in Japan, uh, you have to finish every small details even uh, before going to the customer uh, because of the customer respect. Uh, I would like to express this. I don't know if it is useful. <laughs> Uh, it is very helpful, and this is the same what I have uh, also observed with my uh, with our Japanese clients when they are uh, making their investments in Turkey. So it is very uh, similar, I can say. Uh, it was very helpful. Thank you. Linked again with my uh, previous question, maybe you have provided the 360 degree advice and also uh, insight about the uh, business in Japan. Uh, it was very helpful. And you have also mentioned that you have encountered some challenges. So what would be the most crucial difference in business you have observed by doing business in Japan that you could let us know and we could uh, have it as a takeaway from today? Um, okay, uh, it's a very good question. In my opinion, if a company uh, who would like to act uh, just lean startup style, um, cannot be successful in Japan. Um, Japanese uh, companies, even customers, uh, we are in B2B business. I mean, all the things which I'm explaining are related to B2B business. Um, if you are going to a business to sell any services or any product, um, 
you have to be prepared very well. You have to provide all necessary information to customer. You have to be ready to answer all the questions. Uh, and you should do everything in a smooth way, not hurry. Uh, and everything should be ready. Because of this reason, you should be very uh, planned uh, company. Uh, I mean, there are some cultures of the companies. If your uh, company culture is a kind of lean startup, if you would like to go and provide something to the market and depending on the answers, you would like to change something. In my opinion, this is not for Japanese market. You have to be very planned uh, process flow. Uh, if the company's culture is not this, in my opinion, they may have some difficulties in Japan. And also, if they are working with a Japanese company, the Japanese company will have some difficulties working with you. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Japanese people would like to talk in Japanese. Uh, I believe they know how to uh, speak English or I believe they understand English, uh, but they don't prefer to speak. Uh, they would like to speak in Japanese, even though you are in the meeting, uh, maybe 50 or more than 50% of the meeting is in Japanese language. Uh, because of this reason, in my opinion, um, any company who would like to invest in Japan should make a kind of joint venture or find a, a local Japanese partner, etc. Um, and also, as I understood, Japanese uh, business responsible are preferring to deal with Japanese companies also. Uh, if you are a foreign company um, and uh, if you don't have any uh, Japanese um, background in Japan for, for long times, if you are quite new, in my opinion, you don't have much chance to work with them because trust and respect is too more, too, too uh, two uh, important uh, issues. Uh, because of this reason, I suggest to find a local partner or establish a joint venture uh, and uh, be ready uh, acting a very planned manner. I can express this. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aileen Hanım, for your valuable contribution. Um, as you have stated, I would also agree Japanese and Turkish business styles contain differences in nature. We observe Japanese bring planning, time management, listening, listening skills to their investment. And Turks on the other uh, side, maybe we can say, co can complement their Japanese partners with their skills of persuasive speech, crisis management, and hardworking workforce. So, such differences in nature when come together usually create a very productive atmosphere and synergy yeah. for joint success, but uh, with the caveat, if they can be managed carefully. So yes. maybe we can sum up, sum up like that. Yes, you mentioned very important uh, matters also. Uh, and you are right. I believe that uh, the combination, the synergy is uh, very big because we have some advantages, Japanese people have some other advantages, and we can, if we can establish a, a common uh, working area, the, the uh, synergy is uh, higher, very, very big. You are right. <laughs> I agree. Thank you very much. While ending our session here, uh, we wish a good partnership and business in Japan for all of our guests here. So thank you again, Aileen Hanım, and all uh, guests uh, have a great weekend. Aileen Hanım Duygu, thank you very much for this uh, session. Hearing real life experiences was really insightful. Uh, before ending our webinar, I would like to um, thank Mr. Sarıbekir, Vice Chairperson of Turkey Japan Business Council, um, to Foreign Economic Relations Board, DEIC, for organizing this webinar with us. Uh, each one of uh, our speakers and moderators who shed light on to doing business in Japan with Japan and share their experiences. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all of the participants for taking their time to listen to us today. 
Um, as Baker McKenzie, Istanbul and Tokyo offices under the roof of our Japan Turkey desk, we have been working as a bridge between two countries, two cultures, and working on improving foreign investments and relations for many years now. Understanding the culture and the expectations is also what makes our Japan Turkey desk unique, I believe. Um, you can always contact us at our website. Um, as an attorney partnership is the name we use for Turkey for regulatory reasons. And as the head of Japan Turkey desk, I will be happy to help exchange ideas and direct to the right person if you have any questions. Thank you very much.